student from last year just texted me. Happens. Hey Dennis, I have a question for you. It's not my call, obviously. Uh, it's the school's physio, but I was just curious for my sake. They diagnosed a second borderline third degree elbow MCL sprain. Um, and she was asking, would you put it in a brace to help stiffen it up? So it's a second, maybe third degree MCL. So we do cladal ligament sprain on the elbow. Second, third degree. Would you put it in a brace? Uh, I shouldn't say what's for it. It's a second, third degree, so they're probably playing for a while. Uh, I can ask. So, what would you do? I know you guys have just barely touched modalities, so like uh, healing phases. I don't. Have you guys talked about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Women's hockey. Why did you do it? Sorry. I guess just recently, a few days ago, because they taped her yesterday and told her to try to practice. <laughs> 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 Look at me! I didn't tell her. <laughs> See? <laughs> We're all like, uh -huh. okay. So, what do you guys do? Well, she's not playing, obviously. Secondary degree. Oh, what other questions should be asked? What's the inflammation? What's that? What's the inflammation like? Range of motion, pain, if those are used in motion. Okay, a few first aid. History stuff, though. Has she heard before? Has she heard before? So, for our purposes, okay, they tape her to try to play. Oh, no. Interesting. What did she do the first time? Uh, I, I was just thinking what position she plays. MCL, even for a goalie. Mm -hmm. Like glove okay. side, you definitely want, don't want that. The stick side, uh, just in case your stick comes out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so those, are, so those are obviously other questions you can ask, right? Uh, right not play. <laughs> oh, I thought it was broken because I did a tuning fork and she reacted to it, but the x-ray came back clear after. So she was sensitive, so she saw, she referred it as a fracture. And they said, uh, no, taper up the <laughs> Sorry, hard not to laugh. Um, so why would you, why would you brace her? Because that's what she was wondering. She was thinking, I need to brace her. Brace her for just like every day, or just for like, like practicing? Not even, no, so, so no return to play, no return. brace on her. Yeah. Why? Principles of healing. <coughs> it's just recently you're trying to <coughs> allow the healing phase to take place, and if she's moving around, <coughs> then you're gonna be stress. You're gonna be pushing it beyond that stress that's good for it, and it's not gonna be healed properly. And then it turns into something chronic if it doesn't heal properly. Then she goes back into play. So good. best to let it heal and then go. Maybe let her move it after like a, I don't know, four So, so good. More details though. What do you mean by helping it to heal? What, what is the brace going to do? Protect it from? Or her muscles are going to be protected. So yeah, it'll probably split. Yeah. But from further injury? From further injury, okay. Stabilize. Stabilize. If, if, you, if you tear something really good, what does the tissue look like? Think about a rope. Okay, so it's frayed, it's frayed, good. That's a good word, it's frayed, right? Not torn, but how do you help that to heal? Keep it. You bring it together, right? You don't want to go end range of motion because at end range you're going to be in the closed pack position, which stresses that tissue. It'll pull the edges away. It'll never get a chance to heal. And even if you pull the edges away, scar tissue will form in there. Now it's going to be at a length where it's no longer functional. Brace it. Approximate the edges until you're out of the inflammatory phase. It's going to scar and stab friction and then stress it appropriately so the fibers realign the way they should. I guess physio is still running out. I'm just kidding. By the way, I'm an ass when it comes to stuff like that. I screw the pot for a bit. Anyhow, I'm glad she didn't know that's That was happy. Okay, range of motion. On we go. Pronation and supination. You guys have heard these terms before. You go into runner's run, they go, oh, you over pronate. And they actually know what that means. Uh, we don't know. Two different definitions of pronation, two different definitions of 
supination. This is out of Schultz. I don't think it's in the E. I found it in Schultz, though. So it's just food for thought. Pronation and supination occur at several different joints. Because obviously that's not part of your legitimate range of motion for the ankle. Because it's type of flexion, dorsiflexion, and bridge neighbor. So where does pronation and supination come, come in? It's a combination of, of movements at several joints. Now, the reason why there's two is because the foot does something different when you pronate in weight-bearing and non-weight-bearing. Okay? A little different. The difference is here, at the talocrural joint. So if you're non-weight-bearing, which most of the time you'll have them on the table, let me see you flex and extend and invert and invert. Now let me see you pronate. And what they'll do when they pronate is try to make their foot go into eversion, but they'll use the rest of their foot to do that. Now when they do that naturally, in a non-weight-bearing position, the subtalar joint will evert, because that's what they're doing. Right? No, sorry, pronation. Pronation, yeah. Subtalar will evert. The talocrural joint, they will naturally just pull their toes up when they do that. They'll go into dorsiflexion. And then the mid-tarsals, We'll go into a little bit of abduction, so they'll come out a little bit as well. Okay, so when you tell them to pronate, it's a combination of those movements. And the opposite occurs, again, non weight bearing, <coughs> the opposite occurs when you supinate. Now, when you walk, the talocrural joint goes into plantar flexion instead. Okay, so when you don't, dorsi, sorry, when you heel strike, you're actually going into plantar flexion as you pronate. plantar flexion point because you have to weight bear. So the movement is plantar flexion. Right? Because if I was dorsiflexing, I would do this. Right? Okay, so that's the difference. The opposite occurs with supination. That might be something to read over and kind of visualize and then do yourself to actually let it sink in a little bit. Um, but it's something to consider. Okay, because if they complain of pain during pronation on the table, <coughs> as they walk, the pain is no longer there. The only difference is here. So the pathology might occur or be occurring at the talocrural joint. Okay. If pronation hurts on the table and it's different when they weight bear, the difference between the two positions is just this. That's where the pathology may lie. Okay. So this is a checkpoint where you would have to do that. Just articulate, and you can do it on the table with your partner. We'll give you a couple minutes to do that. I'll put the other slide back up. But just verbalize and do pronation supination and try to pick the difference between the two at the subtalar, talocrural, and mid-tarsal joints. Okay, so actually go through those movements, non-weight bearing, with pronation, and then weight bearing with pronation, don't do supination. The difference between non-weight bearing and weight bearing when it comes to pronation only. Okay, so articulate it, and then try to visualize it by doing the movement on the table with your partner, and then even by taking a few steps on the ground. Okay, so we'll give you a couple minutes to practice that so you're familiar with the difference between testing on the table and testing on the ground. Okay, so the reason why I had you guys go through that is just to let you know that there is a difference when you, te when you test somebody on the table and non weight bearing, and when you test somebody weight bearing. Okay, things do change it's a little bit. And so their symptoms might change as well. So if their symptoms change, certain things to consider are the differences between weight bearing and non weight bearing when it comes to these joints and what happens. Okay, okay so those are your ranges. That's just right out of the book. Those are the numbers. Um, Janelle and myself um, want you to verbalize, generally speaking, how much range of motion, from an objective perspective, there is in the joint that you test. You don't have to be exact, you don't have to be within five degrees, but 
at least get in the habit of verbalizing how much range of motion you think there is. Okay? These are some guidelines in Schultz and NAP. End fields. Uh, the one thing I did not mention, or we didn't mention in principles of assessment, in that if you look at me and you look at Schultz, their normal end fields, they use different terms. But they mean the same thing. So if you're reading literature on end fields, for whatever reason, if they use soft, firm, and hard, those are valid terms to use for end fields. Because that's what they use out of Schultz. In McGee, they use this. Because these are more descriptive. From a, a, a feel, from your manual feel standpoint, this is more descriptive when it comes to what's actually happening with the tissue. What would you say soft tissue approximation is with respect to one of these? Get it? Okay, usually, it's soft. Tissue stretch, firm, because there has to be an end feel. Bone to bone is usually hard. Okay, it's, it's the same thing. It's just. If you run into one term, that's what it means. Um, and Schultz uses the same terms here for abnormal end fields. Again, when you're doing range of motion testing, you need to verbalize range of motion, your end fields, and you need to provide the instructions to the patient. If there's any pain or discomfort, let me know. <coughs> I usually take it a step further when I assess a patient and I ask them, any time it hurts, give me a number out of 10, and let me know if the location of the pain changes, because it sometimes will. Okay? So for everything that I do, if there's any pain or discomfort, let me know. Give me a number and point to where it hurts. Okay? If you leave that one instruction at the beginning, your model will repeat that throughout the entire assessment. What you have to do is constantly repeat your end range of motion and your ranges of motion anytime you test a joint. Um, just a note, so the palocrural joint, the end feels tissue stretch, plantar flexion, dorsiflexion. Plantar <coughs> flexion, greater loss than dorsiflexion with injuries. So if you get injured, if you twist your ankle, plantar flexion tends to go first. You'll have more range of motion loss with plantar flexion. If you also have deficits in dorsiflexion, generally it's, more, it's a more severe injury. Uh, tissue stretch for inversion and eversion at the subtalar joint. The tarsal metatarsal joints tissue stretch. And again, like we said, about 95% of your end feels all over the body is tissue stretch. Okay, so the next few slides deal with resistant range of motion. And so what we'll do is we'll actually go through, you guys can practice your hand placements. I'll come around and make sure your hand placements are where they need to be. Thunder inflection, dorsal inflection, inversion, inversion. We'll do active first. Get your spiels nice and clear for your patient, whether it be an older patient who's 80 years old or a 10 year old. It has to be clear so they understand what you want them to do. Active, add the overpressure, state your end feel. And actually feel what it feels like. Okay, they're all to stretch. And then, resistant range of motion. Rules for resistant range of motion, one hand on either side of the joint. Okay? Any questions? What else are you verbalizing for, for resistant range of motion? Their strength. Strength rating. Okay, so what do you think it is? Okay, so let's do that. Give me about 15, 20 minutes to work on that. I'm gonna come around. I may actually get one of you to come up at a time and do some of the testing on me so I know your hand placements are right now and you're using enough pressure. Okay, but practice it a few times in the department. Okay, uh, just one second before we move on. We'll do some other stuff because um, I think some people are more ahead than others. Um, so again, I'll just repeat the guidelines, right? Uh, stabilize on either side of the joint and don't cross joints. Uh, for plantar flexion more so because you're going to be pushing them into dorsiflexion, they're going to push against you get a better stance and move away and then kind of lean with your body. If you stand right up and try to do this, you're not really testing their strength. Some people don't even test the plantar flexion and see it. They'll actually have them stand on the ground and do heel raises, which I think is a little bit more appropriate. That's just me, though. Um, but for someone who's injured that can't do that, then you need to get a good stance and push and kind of lean into it. Um, if you've already switched and gone through active, passive, and resisted, 
Um, yeah. Here are some examples of how you can be a little bit more specific. So we're into manual muscle testing for specific muscles. So for trans, sorry, tibialis anterior, dorsiflexion and inversion combined. So the best way to test a, a, a muscle specifically is put that limb in the position where that muscle actually functions. So if we were to have Jeff invert and dorsiflex at the same time, invert and dorsiflex, he would hold that position first and then meet your resistance. And then you can say tibialis anterior. Because the tendon inserts where? Base of the medial side. Base of the first metatarsal first and medial cuneiform. That's where your stabilization should be. Because that's the other end of the tendon. Okay? So tibia, and then around the first metatarsal head is kind of where you want to stabilize the other hand. And then resist whatever he's doing. Okay. So, just use that as a guideline, and then try the other ones. Extensor digitorum longus, extensor pollucis longus, tibialis posterior is plantar flexion with the eversion. No, sorry, that's pronius tertius. Dorsiflexion. So dorsiflexion with the eversion is pronius tertius. Okay? And that's my tone four. So try those ones. I'll leave that up for a couple of minutes so you can go through this. And then the next slide we'll do some plan reflection ones as well.